guys, we have already learned bit logic operations. In this video, we are going to learn the S7 1200 timer operations. The first timer is the generate pulse timer. Then we will do a simple exercise to learn how does the timer work. Let's start learning the S7 1200 timers. This is the ladder symbol of the generate pulse timer. This instruction is used to set the output for a programmed duration. Here is its first input. This timer generates a pulse. If the RLO at this input changes to 1, generally this block needs a signal like this to generate a pulse. The second input needs a number as its preset time value. The CPU uses 32 bits to store a time number. With 32 bits we can store time up to 24 days, 20 hours, 31 minutes, 23 seconds and 647 milliseconds. This is the maximum time you can give to your pulse timer. Setting a time is very easy. For example, it can be 2 days and 3 minutes and 6 milliseconds. Also, timers need a data block to work correctly. Now the question is, what is a data block? A data block is a block that stores all parameters of this timer. It stores the parameters like how much is the preset time and what is the status of the inputs and outputs. So I can say a data block is a memory that stores some parameters that we can access this data in our program. So if we use another timer, we need another data block such as DB2 or DB3. Okay, when this timer is activated, we will have a pulse here for two seconds. Also, we can store the current or elapsed time. It means when the timer is started, this output shows us the current time. In other words, how much time it has already executed. We need 32 bits to store this time. Here, the MD0 address is used, but what is the meaning of MD0? Do you remember this table from the second video? This table shows us the memory structure. As you know, the memory consists of some bytes and each byte has 8 bits from bit 0 to bit 7. We have used this format to refer to one bit on the PLC memory or refer to a digital input or output. For a byte, we write MB and then write the desired byte number. As you can see, if we need two bytes, we write MW. Now we need 32 bits to store the RASP time. So we need to use the D letter between M and its first byte number. So MD0 uses byte 0 to byte 3 on the PLC memory. An important point is that if we use MD0 for our timer, we must not use MW0. MB0, M0.6 or M1.4 because these bits are used in the MD0 and we must not use them for another purpose. Thus, 
The next free memory will be M4.0. For example, if we have an another timer, the next address which can be used is MD4. Now let's take a look at this diagram. When we have a positive edge at the start input, we will have a pulse at the timer output for two seconds. As you can see, if the start input remains one, after two seconds, we don't have another pulse until the next positive edge. See here, when the timer is on, it does not detect any positive edge, which can make the timer start from first. Pay attention here. If the start input changes to zero before two seconds, this timer will continue its work and generates a pulse for two seconds. Now let me show you a diagram for the ET output, which shows the last time. When this timer generates a pulse at its first output, the ET output increases linearly. When the last time reaches the preset time value, if the RLO at the start input be 1, this output will hold its last time until the RLO at the start input to change to a 0. As you can see, for the next pulse and after 2 seconds, the RLO is 0 at the start input. So the ET output returns to zero immediately after two seconds. Let's see this instruction in the TIA. From the instruction list here, insert the pulse timer. Automatically, TIA wants to specify a data block for the inserted timer. Let's write a name for this data block. Note that we cannot connect a timer to the left line directly. So I insert a contact with the M0.0 address of memory. For the second input, we need time. The format of the time is a T letter plus a number sign plus time value and the time unit. Here, if you don't write a T letter and a number sign, the T adds them to your time automatically. Here, I want to store an elasp time on the PLC memory. I cannot use MD0 because of this bit of memory, M0.0. Let's see this table again. M0.0 is here, inside the byte 0. So I cannot use MD0 because M0.0 is a bit of this address, but all bits of the MD1 are available. So I can use MD1 to store the elasp time value. Now let me assign a tag to MD1 address. Do not forget to try to define a tag for each address. Let's test this timer. When we use a bit of memory for a contact, we can right click and change its value. When this contact changes from 0 to 1, 
we have a pulse at its output for 10 seconds. Now pay attention. Here we can see the use data blocks in our programs. Now I have one data block which has been used for the timer. Now switch to the function block language. As you can see, the FPD and the ladder symbol of this timer are similar. Just the order of the Q and the ET outputs are exchanged. All right, let's do an exercise. Write a program with two LED blinker indicators and two start and stop push button switches. First, pause the video and try to write the program by yourself. Now, let's see my solution. Insert two assignment instructions respectively to the green and red lamps. Then I use two pulse timers. The green lamp will be on for five seconds and the other one for seven seconds. I want when the start push button is pressed, in other words, after this push button gives us a positive H signal, the green lamp to be on for five seconds. At the end of this pulse, when the green lamp is going to be off, we have a negative pulse and we want the state of the red lamp to change to on. So here I use this negative pulse to turn the red lamp on for seven seconds. Again, I can use the negative pulse of the red lamp to turn the green lamp on. All right, let's see how does the program work. First, if the start push button is pressed, the green lamp will be on for five seconds. Then the red lamp will be on for seven seconds and this cycle repeats itself. To stop the cycle, I must prevent these three pulses to reach the timers. Let's use the start contact here. So when this push button is released, this pulse cannot reach the first timer. In consequence, it makes the cycle to stop. Pay attention to this program. If we want to start this process and also continue it, we must press and hold the start push button. To solve this problem, let me use an SR instruction with two start and stop contacts. So instead of holding the start push button, I can store and hold the start request on a bit of memory. Now let's use this bit, M0.0, .0 instead of the I0.0 .0 address in the second network. Let's transfer this program to the virtual PLC. Now let's test this program with the factory I.O. I hope you know already how to use the software from watching the previous videos. As you can see, when I press and release the start push button, the green and the red lights start to blink.
Similarly, I can test this program with my PLC that I explained its necessary settings already. Here the two first outputs are connected to the red and the green lamp in the factory I.O. Now let's have an overview of the program in FPD language. Let me explain only the green light network. Others are similar. First, we have an OR logic with this branch and OR instruction is used in the FPD language program, respectively. Then with the series assignment, we have an AND logic As you can see, the FPD language uses this AND instruction as well. Then, in both languages, we have a pulse timer and an assignment instruction. These two programs have the same logic. You may prefer to use the function block diagram instead of the ladder language. Now, we are going to see how on and off delay timers work. Then we will do a simple project to use these timers for a line production. All right. Let's start with the on delay timer symbol in ladder language. An on delay timer instruction is used to set an output to on after elapsed of a preset time. Here the preset time is 5 seconds. This timer has two inputs, which are the start and the preset time, and this is the maximum time that can be entered, like a pulse timer. Also, this timer needs a data block to work properly, and it has two outputs. Now let's see what an on-delay timer is and how does it work. When a RLO changes from a 0 to a 1, this timer starts timing. After the last of a preset time value, its output turns on. Here, when the last time at ET output reaches 5 seconds, the output of this timer will be on. If the input signal changes to zero, the output will be off immediately. Now see here, if the start input goes to a one and comes back to zero before the ET output reaches the preset time value, the output will remain zero or false. For example, if we have a pulse for two seconds, which is less than the preset time, the output remains off. Now let's do an exercise. Let's write a program using a push button based on the following conditions. First, the program should turn on an alarm siren for five seconds and then it turns on an alarm light and then after five seconds it turns on a motor here we have a push button and three outputs a motor an alarm light and an alarm siren Well, if the push button is pressed, the alarm siren must be on for 5 seconds. So I need a pulse timer that I explained about it in the previous video.
Let's see the PLC wiring. The serial is connected to the Q0.2. So I enter this address here. I want to turn on the alarm light immediately after the push button is pressed. So I connect the alarm light output to the start contact without any timer. Its address is Q0.1. Finally, the motor must be on after 5 seconds. Here I have a delay to start the motor. So I need to use an on delay timer. As you can see in the PLC wiring, the motor is connected to Q0.0. All right, this program is completed. Here I have the virtual PLC. Let me transfer this program. Let's use the factory I.O. to test this program. As you have seen before, here I can connect the factory I.O. devices to my PLC. Now let's test the program. As you can see, when I press this push button and hold it, first the alarm siren and the light are turned on. After 5 seconds, the alarm siren will be off and the conveyor motor starts to move the boxes. Similarly, I can test this program with my PLC that I explained its necessary setting earlier. Here the first three outputs are used to turn on the conveyor motor, the alarm light and the alarm siren that are linked to the factory I.O. Now let's take a look at the off delay timer. This instruction is used to turn off the output after the preset time value. The ladder symbol of this timer is similar to the previous one. We can notice this timer with this small syntax TOF. Now look at this diagram. When the start input goes to 1, the output starts immediately. But when the start input returns to a zero, the output will be zero after the preset time value.
Here when the start input goes to a zero, the ET output starts to increase from zero to five seconds. After that, the output will be zero or off. Pay attention here. When the start input goes to zero, before the ET output reaches the preset time value, the start input goes to a 1. Again, in this condition, the output remains on or true. Note that this timer turns its output off when the ET output reaches the preset time after the last negative pulse at its start input. Let's write a simple program using the off delay timer. See this PLC wiring. Here we have two outputs. I want to write a program to turn on a motor and a fan. When the motor is stopped, the fan will be on for one minute. Well, before going any further, pause the video and try to do this exercise by yourself. And then compare your solution with mine. Alright, I have two push buttons. I don't want to press and hold the push buttons like in the previous exercise. So I use an SR flip-flop to hold the states of the start and stop request in a bit of memory. This bit will be used to turn on or outputs in the next network. Pay attention. Because my stop push button is normally closed, here I use a normally closed contact. We know that a SR flip-flop need a bit of memory to work correctly. I will use this bit of memory to start and stop all outputs as well. So let me define a, an appropriate tag for this bit of the memory. We can define an appropriate name for each network as well. This makes the program more clear. Based on this wiring, the motor and the fan are connected to the Q0.0 .0 and the Q0.2 addresses. I want to start and stop the conveyor motor immediately after I press the start and stop push buttons. So I just need to connect the motor coil to the start and stop bit of the memory which has been defined in the first network. I want to use the start and stop contact to turn on off the fan and the motor, but when the motor is stopped, the fan must be stopped after a delay. So before the fan coil, I need to insert an off delay timer in my program.
Here I need a one minute delay to turn the fan off. Now this program is complete. Let's transfer it to the virtual PLC. Before that, let's reset the CPU by clicking on the MRES or memory reset icon. Now I change this normally closed contact. Now let me activate the start contact. As you can see, the both outputs are on. Now if I change the state of the stop contact, it makes the PLC to turn the motor off immediately, but the fan stays on for one minute and then it is turned off. Now, after a short review of the on and off delay timers, we are going to do a simple project. All right, this is the ladder symbol of an on-delay timer. And this is its FPD symbol. And these are the off-delay timer symbol in ladder and FPD languages. We can notice these timers with the syntax of TON and TOF respectively. As it was mentioned earlier, each timer needs a data block to work properly. Each timer has two outputs, but their sequence in ladder and FPD languages are different. If we need to store and use the elasp time, we must use an address with 32 bits such as MD4. MD4 refers to a PLC memory which includes byte 4 to 7. Now let's do a simple project using the on and off delay timers. See this production line which has been designed in the factory I.O. Here we have four outputs, M1 to M4. M1 is an emitter in the factory I.O. This enters boxes to the design plant. M2 and M3 are two conveyors which move boxes and M4 is a remover. Well, here is a question. To start this line, should we turn on equipment from M1 which is at the first of this plant or from M4 which is the last equipment? Let's do a small test. As you can see here, if the first conveyor is started and the second one cannot be turned on for any reason, the boxes are accumulated on the second conveyor. So usually the equipment is started from the last to the first one in a line production. Also, when a line is going to be stopped, equipment is turned off from the first of a line to its last equipment. Otherwise, some boxes may remain on the conveyors. So try to write a program to turn on these four outputs from M4 to M1 
and turn off them from M1 to M4. Well, this is our PLC wiring for this project. There are two start and stop push buttons. In this wiring, four outputs are connected to the PLC outputs. We do need to use relays to turn on off the conveyor motors, but for the sake of the simplicity, here we only want to learn to program our PLCs. So to test the program, I am not going to be worry about the power circuit. Let's write a program in ladder language. I need this block to use the factory I.O. beside the virtual PLC. Now let's insert four assignments for the four outputs. By default, in every network, comments of the first output appear here. Now let me save the start and stop request on a bit of memory. Okay, maybe you say this program is wrong because the last network must be used in the first network, similar to the previous videos. Pay attention, the CPU runs the network 1, 2, and 3 to network 6 and repeats the process. So although network 6 is placed at the end of this program, it is executed at the first of the next repetition. Now let me place the start and stop bit of a memory at the first of each output.
Let's see the plant. When the start push button is pressed, the emitter which is placed at the first of this plant must be turned on after all devices. If I consider 5 seconds for each output, the emitter must be turned on after 15 seconds. The first conveyor must be started after the second conveyor and the remover. So when the start push button is pressed, this output must be turned on after 10 seconds. In the same way, I need 5 seconds of delay to start the second conveyor. The last output is the remover, which must be started immediately after the start push button is pressed. So, for this output, we don't need any delay. But when the stop push button is pressed, this output must be turned off after all of the other devices. So here, I insert an off delay timer with 15 seconds. For the same reason, I insert two off delay timers with uh, 10 and 5 seconds. The first output is the emitter. It must be stopped immediately after the stop push button is pressed. So for this output, I don't need an off delay timer. Another point in programming is considering some safety conditions. We want to start the emitter when all of the other devices are on. So I insert a normally open or NO contact of other outputs before this output. With this logic, if the remover or the first or second conveyor is a stop, the virtual power cannot reach the emitter and thus this output will be off. For this reason, I insert two normally open contacts of the second conveyor and the remover here. Well, here I just insert a normally open contact of the remover. Therefore, if the remover is off, the second conveyor can be turned on. Alright, let me transfer this program to a virtual PLC.
Now I link this plan to my virtual PLC. Based on this wiring, factory devices must be connected to the PLC input outputs. Now let me test the program. It seems there is a problem. My start push button doesn't work. Let's see its related contact in my program. All right, the SR flip flop is resetting its output because the stop push button is a normally closed contact. Here I have to use a normally closed contact at the reset input of the flip-flop in the program. So let me modify the program. If I press the start push button, the second and the first conveyor the emitter will be on after 5, 10, and 15 seconds respectively. Now let me press the stop push button. It makes PLC stop the emitter immediately. Then after 5, 10 and 15 seconds, the first, the second conveyor and the remover will be off respectively. As you can see, my program needs a little modification time-wise. Because after the line is stopped, a box is still on the conveyor. Try to do this modification just by changing the preset times. I have done this modification. Let me test the program with the PLC and the factory I.O. I explained the necessary settings in the previous videos already. stop the factory line. As you can see, at this time, my program is working correctly. I hope you have understood a a start sequence in a production line. Now I am going to discuss the retentive undelay timer. Then some instructions will be explained to 
start and reset the timers. Also, we will see how we can change the preset time. Finally, I will do a project with the factory I.O. Let's start with the retentive on delay timer or time accumulator. This instruction is used to accumulate time values when its IN input is activated. We can notice this timer with TONR syntax. It means timer on with reset. Because this timer has a reset input, the function of other input outputs of this timer is similar to the previous timers that were explained already. Now let's see how this timer works. First, suppose there are three pulses at the IN input. When the signal state at the IN input changes from a 0 to 1, the time measurement is executed. The time values are increased and accumulated when the state of the signal on the IN input is a 1 or true. For the first pulse, the ET value starts from 0 to 5 seconds. When the signal state at the IN input changes from a 1 to 0, the ET output holds elapsed time, which is 5 seconds. When the second pulse reaches the IN input, the ET value starts from 5 seconds to 7.5. When the third pulse appears, the ET value reaches the preset time. The timer enables the Q output. The Q parameter remains set to a 1. Even when the signal state at the IN input changes from a 1 to 0. The timer holds its ET value and also the Q output remains on until the timer receives a positive signal edge at its R input or at its reset input. Now pay attention when both IN and R inputs of this timer are activated simultaneously, the R input takes priority over the IN input and at this stage the timer will be reset. Well, let's test this timer in the TIA. We are using a template that enables us to use the factory I.O. beside the PLC SIM simulator. The first block in the network one is for this purpose. So let me insert a retentive on-delay timer in the next network. Here I have a virtual PLC. I click on MRES or memory reset icon to reset its memory. Then let me save, compile and transfer the program. Pay attention, because of my template and the first network, I can use the factory I.O. and also change the input contacts by the right click. Otherwise, we must use a SIM or a force table to change input addresses. Exercise with this timer and learn how it functions.
Well, let me exit from the simulation mode and see my program in the FPD language. As you can see, the FPD and the ladder symbols are similar to each other. Now we are going to see other timer instructions. These instructions are placed here under the timer operation folder. First, there are four instructions to start four timers, which we worked with them already. These start an inserted timer with a specified preset time. For example, suppose we have inserted an on-delay timer. With this program, I can start timer 1 from another network with the preset time of equal to 10 seconds. Also, this is its FPD symbol. Okay, here are the reset and the load instructions. The first instruction is used to reset timers, like this program, which can reset timer 1 with I0.0 address. Pay attention, both sides of this instruction have the same RLO. So if the I0.0 address is activated, the timer 1 is reset and the Q0.0 will be on. With the second instruction, we can change the preset time of timers, like in this program. Alright, how does this instruction work? See this timer. As you know, every timer uses a data block, which is used to store its data, such as its preset time. So the timer parameters can be changed with a specified address on the related data block. Let's use the three last instruction in the TIA. Others are similar. Okay, in this case, I have created a new project. I didn't use my template, which was suitable for the TIA to link it to the factory I.O. So I don't have any blocks in the first network. Now let me insert a retentive on-delay timer. In network 2, I use the reset timer instruction. Here I must select a use timer. In the next network, let me use two contacts with the two load preset time instructions. For this instruction, we must select a use timer and a value for the preset time. 
So the first line will change the preset time to 5 seconds and now I write a program to change the preset time to 15 seconds. Now let me test the program. As you can see here, I cannot change the state of this input, unlike the previous program. Because in this case, I don't use my template, which was designed to be used with the factory I.O. I have to use a sim or force table. Let's test it with a sim table. As you can see, with the I0.0 contact, I can activate this timer. With the I0.1 contact, in the next network, I can reset my timer. Now, see the third network. The preset time of my timer is 10 seconds. I can use the I0.2 and I0.3 in the third network to change the preset time to 5 or 15 seconds. Alright, all timer instructions have been explained. 
we are going to do a project to use them in an industrial process. Let's get into it. Here we have a tank which can be filled and drained by two valves. Let me take you to the environment with the factory I.O. There is a valve at the top of the tank. If I activate this valve, it will fill the liquid into the tank. The valve is a digital actuator and can be turned either on or off. At the bottom, there is a discharge valve. So if I activate this valve, it discharges the liquid from the tank to the underground. Also, here we have a panel. Now let's define the project and see what we can do with this panel. Here is an emergency button which can be used to stop the system operation immediately. This push button is used to turn the fill valve on and this normally closed push button is used to turn the discharge valve on. Also here we have two selectors. The first one can be used for an auto manual selection. In the manual mode, every valve will be off until its push button is pressed. In the auto mode, when a push button is pressed, the related valve will be on for a specified amount of time. The amounts of the time are either 10 or 20 seconds which can be chosen by the next selector. Now let's design this plant. First let me open the factory I.O. Well, I click on open. Here we can see the previous projects. Click on the scenes option. Now we can see some pre-designed plans which can be selected and used. In this project, I start with the filling tank timers. Here are the fill and discharge valves. Now I want to modify the control box. First, let's remove this displayer. Now let me insert an emergency switch and two selectors. Now click here to see and modify tags. These are all emergency, the fill and the discharge tags. Click on the selector tag to modify it. This selector determines two modes, the auto and the manual modes. Also, I change this selector tag to time 10 seconds and time 20 seconds.
Now let's start the programming. First, let me define my PLC input output tags. Here we have five pieces of equipment which must be linked to the PLC inputs. Pay attention, each selector has two modes and will need two PLC inputs. So, based on this control box, we need seven PLC inputs. First, I define suitable tags for the PLC inputs. Also, we have two fill and discharge valves which must be connected to the PLC outputs. All right, these are my input outputs tags which are used in the factory I.O. and the TIA. Let's start programming. Until now, we have written our programs in the main block in OB1 or the first organization block. Then, we could divide our program into some networks to have a better structured program. As usual, at the first network, we have a block that is started with FC or the function. This function contains some programs codes that help us to use the factory I.O. beside the PLC SIM simulator. As you can see, in this project we are going to use two functions. When the manual mode is selected, this function will be executed, which includes a suitable program for that mode. And when the automatic mode is selected, this related function will be executed. Now let's see how we can define a function in the TIA. Click here in the program blocks. Select a function and then define a name for that. First, I am going to write a program for the manual mode. So I write manual function. Now click on OK to open this function. As you can see, here we can write our program like the main block. Also, this function is appeared on the left side in the program blocks folder. My program will call the manual function. As you can see, in this mode, when the fill or discharge push buttons are pressed, they will turn on the related valve. Pay attention. In the factory I.O., the discharge push button is normally closed, so I have to use a normally closed contact here. Sometimes, based on an industrial process, we need to consider some safety conditions in our program. For example, suppose the fill and the discharge valve cannot be on simultaneously. For this condition, a normally closed contact is added to the first line. Let's see how this program works. When the fill push button is pressed, the virtual power reaches this contact. If the discharge valve is off, this contact will pass the virtual power. So the fill valve will change to on. But if the discharge valve is on, it makes this contact change to open, so the virtual power won't reach the fill valve. For the same reason, let's add a normally closed contact of the fill valve in the second line. 
you are expected to be able to write this simple program in the first function like this. I am in the first function. Now let's open the main block. Here in the network 2, I insert the manual selector contact and my function. So when the manual mode is selected, this function will be executed. As you see, you can right click on each function to open and view its program code. This is my program for the manual mode. Now I am going to use another function for the automatic mode. Now let's see my program for the automatic mode in the second function. In the first line, when the fill push button is pressed, it activates this pulse timer with this preset time. So it turns the fill valve on for a specified amount of time. Also, with the second and third lines, we can change the preset time of this timer to 10 or 20 seconds. Like the previous function, here I insert a normally closed contact with the discharge valve before the pulse timer and the fill valve contact. All right, this program turns on the fill valve in the auto mode. As you can see, we need a similar program for the discharge valve with another pulse timer. Pay attention here. Normally closed contact is used because the discharge push button is a normally closed one. Now in this function, let's write the automatic program like this. Now let's open the main block and call the auto function in the third network. Finally, in the last network of the main block, I am going to use the emergency button to reset all timers and outputs. Now my program is complete. Let's transfer it to a virtual PLC. Now let me link the factory I.O. equipment to the virtual PLC. First, I click on Configuration. Here, I select my PLC type and also change the number of its input outputs.
now I link the equipment to the virtual PLC based on my PLC tag table. All right, let's start the simulation. As you can see, this selector determines which function is executed in the program. First, I select the manual mode. Let's test the push buttons. When I press the fill or the discharge push button, the fill or discharge valve will be on respectively. Now I select the automatic mode and then open the auto function. Note that in this mode I can change the preset time with this selector. In the auto mode, when I press the fill or discharge push button, the related values will be on for the specified amount of time. 10 or 20 seconds. Now the discharge valve is open, so based on my program, I cannot turn the fill valve on until the discharge valve is already turned off. Also, when the emergency button is activated, all timers and outputs are reset. Similarly, I can test this program with my PLC. Note that this selector determines the system mode, which is set to either to the manual or the automatic mode. When the system is in manual mode, I can turn on the filling and the discharging valves manually. When the system is in the automatic mode, each push button turns on its related valve for a specified amount of time. Alright, we got to the end of this video. In the next video, we will start counter operations. Thank you for watching this video. See you in the next video.